Remember that for the next few days, I'm going to be starting these videos out, uh, kind of putting the word out that we're going to be starting a Bible study, an online Bible study. I've already got enough people for um, for a little group. Usually, if I have at least three people who are interested, then we're good to go. And I've already got three people. So if anyone else is interested, please email me at carrie at drcarriehorn.com, C-A-R-R-I-E at D-R-C-A-R-R-I-E. H-O-R-N.com. The only thing that you'll need is Skype. I think we're going to use Skype instead of the usual portal that we use because that extends. And we've got some people that are um, uh, out of the United States. And I don't think they're able to use that the freeconferences.com, which is usually what we use for workshop. So it's exciting. I'm very excited that we get to do that together. I'm just excited to connect with you guys as well. So for those of you who've been talking about wanting some sort of a group to link into, missing, you know, church and congregation, this is a really good way to connect with other people who are like-minded and who are searching the word of God. We're going to start today in Luke 7. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him, with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority whose soldiers with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterward, Jesus was, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to ask to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? I I just want to say right there that always has kind of puzzled me because by this time we read that John the Baptist had already baptized, baptized Jesus and saw the spirit of God descend on him like a dove and heard from heaven, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. So it's always kind of puzzled me, like, why is he asking that at this point? Jesus has already started his ministry. And then, you know, you remember that Paul, after 14 years, wanted to go and meet with the other apostles to make sure he wasn't running this race in vain, to cross-check and make sure that this is who who he is, what he's, you know, what he believes about what he's doing. I want to tell you that personally, this is also my experience. I've been told by God what I'm doing for what I've been set apart, but I'm not in control of it. And neither was Paul and neither was John. And frankly, neither was Jesus. He wasn't in control of it just because the power of God rested on him. He came here as a man. He had to do all of the things that we have to do. There's no indication that Jesus ever questions you know, what he's doing or needs to cross check it or anything like that. So I just want to be clear about him. But for us, there is. And I believe that the reason why is so that we don't end up getting cocky and also so that we end up staying low. We have to stay low 
for our own for our own good, for our own faith and receiving him. And continue I can tell you that in my own experience continually and when I say continually, I mean on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, right? I am continually not feeling as though I have some sort of a guarantee yet. That's why I get so hard on the false already saved doctrine because when you think that you have a guarantee look at the way people act they don't pick it up they don't hang on every word because they don't feel that they need to they aren't continually praying keep me in your name lord like i do keep me in your name whatever you have to do whatever you have to do to my children keep us in your name we don't take that posture when we think that we've already got a guarantee we don't take the posture of, Lord, if I don't have you, I have nothing, nothing. If I've been wrong about this, I have nothing. And so we're continually leaning into him and wanting to make sure that we remain in the name, that we don't fall, that there's no stone unturned, that there's nothing that we're doing that we know is questionable. There was something that I've been complaining about someone, and I had to correct myself today because I realized I don't have any business doing that. I'm supposed to be bearing the image of God, not complaining. So I either pray for this person and take up my grievance with God or stay quiet. I need to stay quiet. If I thought that I already had a guarantee and I didn't need to check myself against what's written in the word, against the covenant that I have with him, I would not feel a need to be disciplined and I would not feel a need to continue striving because It's already been given. Now it's just a matter of time. I'm just waiting this out. And so in waiting this out, might as well make myself comfortable, right? Isn't that the lie that counterfeit Christianity teaches you so that it can make sure that you're not ready when he comes? Isn't that the very reason why when he comes, he says that many are going to say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we eat with you in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, evildoers, I never knew you, because these are wicked and lazy servants. They don't have any concern for truth. So I just want to point that out, that you're not going to feel 100% confident in all times with regard to who you are, with regard to whether you're doing enough. And there's good reason for that, because you're supposed to be hinging and learning continuously. And God is going to, at times, profoundly affirm what you are doing if you are in him. And I experienced one of those times last night. I'm experiencing, you know, a time like that right now. He's brought me in really close and has been pouring love into me. But you also see the way I've been pursuing him for weeks now on wanting to know how to have deeper faith. Not only am I pursuing, but I'm taking others along with me. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm trying this on as I go with you. So it's not as though I'm doing this after the fact and telling you, oh, back in the day when I was pursuing faith. No, we're always pursuing faith. I don't see anyone else doing that. Do you? Anyone taking you along for their spiritual journey? Wearing all that, you know, uncomfortable stuff? I don't think so. I've never seen it anyway. But that's our testimony. That's what we have. It's so weird when people act like they have this guarantee and they're so secure in their position. Listen, the word talks about security in our position, but the word also talks about the fact that we can fall. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. So the word warns us, that's 2 Peter 3, 17, by the way, the word warns us multiple times, not just here, that we can fall from our secure position, which means we're not secure yet. We're only secure as long as we continue to bear this fruit. As long as God continues to give us this confirmation that we're in him, as long as we're continuing to pray and receive being in his name, receive being in his, in his name by receiving being built, by remaining connected to the vine. Otherwise, why do you think that Paul, after 14 years, wanted to make sure 
that he was not running this race in vain. Even with all his preaching and everything that he was doing, why do you think that that was his position? You have to do something if you want to feel that certainty. You have to chase what God has done. You have to remind yourself what God has done. He is not going to give you that that feeling of certainty all the time. He's going to require you to have faith and to hold on to that faith. And how do you do that? You remind yourself of who he is, who he's been, who he says he is, what's written in his word, and then you test that against your life. And you hold on to it, and you hold on to it, and you hold on to it, and you keep enduring. And then he comes and gives you a little more confirmation, takes mercy on you, washes you in love, and you can endure a little bit longer knowing that you are his. So John said, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. How would we stumble on account of Jesus? I mean, I can tell you a few ways I see people stumbling, having a counterfeit version of Jesus, a counterfeit version of his covenant, mince, you know, uh, mixing up his words to suit what their itching ears want to hear not believing in him, having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power. There are so many ways that people are stumbling on account of him. Think about what he says about those who have stumbled, the things that are going to come out of their mouth. Lord, Lord, didn't we eat with you in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? What do people say now about being in his name? They can ask for anything they want as long as they say in the name of Jesus. They are without understanding about what it means to be in his name. You're going to have his name on your forehead if you're in him. What's that name? And so literally, we have depictions of people having some sort of engraving or tattoo on their name or something that lights, I mean, excuse me, on their forehead or something that lights up in Hebrew. Come on. What are we talking about here? In our right hand, in our forehead. Coming out of our mouth, what does it mean to be in his name? His cause, his reason, his purpose. You were set apart for a purpose in his name, in his cause. If my people who are called by my name, does that mean you're called by Elohim, by Jesus, by El Shaddai? Which which name? These are aspects of his name in order to teach us what he stands for. What is his cause? That's what we need to be praying in. And then it makes a little more sense why we would receive it, huh? If you are actually living in his will, for his will, you'll receive whatever you need. So you're always having to check yourself and question yourself to make sure that you are actually in his name. I mean, I'm assuming so because I have to. I always need to be checking my motives. Am I doing this for me or am I doing this for you? If you don't feel the need to do that, you're probably doing it for you because this isn't a natural thing that happens while we're in this condition. So if someone is an Israelite, does that mean that they have the name Israel? If someone is an Edomite, does that mean that they have the name Edom? No, my name could be Carrie Ann, and yet I'm still in Israel, a part of Israel. I represent one aspect of that temple, of that nation, of that body. Many different verbal names to bring together a concept of what it means to be in his name. So what are we going to do now? Argue about how to pray with what verbal name we should pray with? Because I see people doing that. His name is not Jesus, it's Yeshua. Oh, is that the reason I'm not getting what I want in my prayers? Come on. That's ridiculous. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of him, who's not hearing his words and applying them superficially or even not applying them. 
and just intellectualizing them or using it to justify themselves. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. Ooh, listen to that, because that's a little bit different. It's, it's not different. It's a different aspect from what we saw in Matthew. In Matthew, it says, no, those who, uh, something to the effect of those who wear expensive clothes or fine clothes are in king's palaces. But this says, no, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. Same thing. He's saying the same thing, but you get that different aspect because it's a different scribe. And I just love that. So he's giving you more of a picture of those who frankly are not of him, are not chosen by God for special purposes. These people have received their reward here on earth. Thank goodness I cleaned out that closet, huh? <laughs> Thank goodness I got rid of those clothes, the shoes, the handbags, the jewelry. Thank goodness. I mean, that was a hard thing to do, but that makes me rejoice because I don't want to be in this category. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. That was Malachi 3.1. And then he says, I tell you among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Look what we have to aspire to. That's what we're going to be surrounded by. So anyone thinking that we're so righteous here, oh my goodness, we're going to be in the presence of righteousness that is beyond our comprehension. All the people, even tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law, listen to that, all of the sinners, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. So what are you doing when you're baptized? Are you making an acknowledgement? Because that's sort of inherent in this statement. All the people, even tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. You are acknowledging that God's ways are right. And if you're acknowledging that God's ways are right, and then you go and do something else, it's worse than if you had not known at all. And that's not an addition to the scroll. That's exactly what the scroll says. If you sin ignorantly, you're going to receive a small lashing. If you sin with knowledge, you are going to receive a large lashing. If you've tasted of the heavenly gift, it's impossible for you to be brought back into repentance because you are crucifying the son all over again and insulting the spirit of grace. Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Always dissatisfied, always complaining about something, right? We played a pipe for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't cry. John the Baptist has a demon. You, you're a drunkard and a glutton. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. Is our generation guilty of the same thing? Because their generation was, so how bad is it now? Now what do we do? I mean, I hear people saying that, it, that they are scared. They're scared when someone identifies themselves as religious. It's somehow bad to identify yourself as religious, which by the way, this is a religion. They prefer to identify themselves as spiritual, but not religious because they associate religion with a church and the abominations of the Catholic harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her. They have their own versions of the Messiah, a Jesus light approach. Apparently it's like a coffee brew. There's light, medium, and dark. What? There's either God's word or there's not. How about these 
misinterpretations redefining love and kindness and tolerance and all of these other things. Love is love. Let me do me. Kindness is everything. What, what does that come to mean? Don't confront me with the Holy One of Israel. Don't confront me on my sin. Always needing some sort of social justice issue to, you know, to scapegoat in order to distract from the bigger issues that are going on. I need reparations for this. I need reparations for that. You don't accept my existence. I mean, it's just a circus now, isn't it? It was back then. It's even worse now, to the point that we don't even perceive what's going on. We think that God's servants are cult-like, that they should mince their words. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have done this to me, telling me that you don't realize the authority that you have. You shouldn't be speaking like this. No, I'm speaking the way God tells me to speak, and I'm speaking what God tells me to speak. And what they have been responding to is reproval usually about idolatry. You hurt my feelings. You don't get to say that. Well, actually, I do. And I must. I'm not going to try to please man over God. I have to say what he tells me to say because I'm not going to have your blood on my head because someone decided that I need to tiptoe around feelings and dilute the word of God in order to soften things up for them. So these are just some of the many ways this has come into play in these days. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. We remember from uh, the book of Mark that we were told that this is Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus, not Mary Magdalene, as this has often been portrayed. This is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Okay, so already people have ideas of what a prophet is supposed to look like, even though they've been sent so many prophets and prophets are never, you know, born to wealth. They're never dressed in the world. They're never appreciated or liked, always persecuted and killed. Do we recognize God's prophets now? Do we recognize his servants now? What are they going to look like now? Are they going to be dressed in fine clothes, beautiful pressed suits so that they can stand before their mega church on their idolatrous pedestal, standing before God, standing in front of God to make his people forget his name? Do they speak tenderly or they speak with authority? Do they mince his truth or do they speak it even though it upsets people? Who are the prophets of the Bible? Do they say things like, oh, I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings. Let me change what, the way that I, you know, God has told me to say this. I mean, I will, I will examine myself and make sure that I'm not doing something out of my own that needs to be corrected. But I'm talking about people who want me to change the message, who are upset about reproval, who think that they can't be questioned or corrected. So this is what the Pharisees seem to think, that if this man were a prophet, he would, not, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And he would apparently recoil because, ugh, who is she? How dare she touch me? But listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to, to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, 
but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Let me ask you something. Who are the ones he chooses? Those who are going to love greatly? The ones who have the greater debt? The ones who understand that they've been chosen by his mercy and sovereign choice? Those who know that they have a great debt and are going to fight the good fight like Paul? Who's he going to choose? Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This book of Luke, I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. I just don't think that I have, um, you know, gravitated toward it, toward it because Matthew, you know, is like at the beginning of the Gospels. I don't know. Was it easier for me to access? And maybe because I, you know, usually when you're going to read the Gospels, you start from Matthew, then you go to Mark and Luke. But that doesn't make sense why I, I know the book of John so well. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm really enjoying this book of Luke. It's just giving me such a deeper perspective and understanding. I hope you're enjoying this, uh, this study as well. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.